And we're live. Yes, we are back after a little while of technical issues. We finally have the track on and we're good to go. So I'm going to try to be as quick as I can. Uh, I'm already going to go and um, paste the link of the survey for y'all on the chat right now on the stage chat. So here you go, the survey link. Uh, after the talk, you can, you know, leave your feedback on the survey. We would appreciate it a lot if you do. Um, well, this is the track one, and we're going to go for the keynote. I have to thank a lot for our sponsors uh, from the bottom of our hearts. It is really, really nice to have uh, people who believe in the event and who want to invest in the event and make this um uh, make this uh, initiative as broad and, and you know, and, and uh, inclusive as, as I can. So thank you all sponsors. I uh, also uh, have a few announcements. The socials after the talk uh, are going to be on the networking feature of Hopin. Uh, you go to the networking and then you go ready and then you can chat with people for 30 minutes, uh, change your connections, uh, change your contacts and have fun there uh, on the website. They have even a few drinks for you to make for yourself if you wanna go and, and come and drink with us on the socials. Um, also for the raffle, uh, I posted the, um, the link of the raffle. I think Nicole pinned it in the chat, in the state chat. If you guys wanna, if you, if you guys and girls and everyone there wants to participate on the raffle, the link is pinned on the stage chat. So y'all are very welcome to participate. Uh, I did, since we were going through technical difficulties, I actually was making uh, <laughs> my own presentation on the jokes that, that you were all doing on the chat. I'm just gonna, gonna go ahead and just go through it. Um, all right, so <laughs> important information and all the talk now. Uh, it is going to be a recorded talk. Uh, Jules is going to be online on the stage chat with y'all so uh, you can talk to her, interact. Uh, she's going to be answering questions live on the, on the chat. Uh, Jules, if you can uh, just wave in the, in the chat uh, for everyone to see you, that would be nice. Just go to the uh, stage chat on your right, uh, as you can see on your hop-in window, and just leave a, a hi there. You can find the chat on the chat options, and then you go to stage. There you go. There she is. She's going to be with, with us all the time. So if you want to hit her with questions, that's the perfect place. Uh, all right. So about Jules, uh, Juliet Okafor, I hope I'm, I'm saying your name out right. If I'm not, you can just <laughs> you can tell me on, uh, whenever you're on. Uh, she's an attorney and the black female founder and CEO of Revolution Cyber, full service managed awareness services firm. Revolution Cyber awareness programs that inspires and engages users to build positive security habits. Given her non-traditional entry into cybersecurity and having overcome many obstacles to achieve her su success, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, my English is not as super. I'm from, from Brazil, I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> um, having to overcome many obstacles to achieve her success, she will be giving a keynote titled Reclaiming Your Space in Cybersecurity. Speak out, speak up, and speak often. I wanna ask a big round of di di digital applause for our keynote, Jules, please come. Come, come, turn on your camera, join us. All right. There she is. Hi, everybody. I really wish I could be there with you, but I'm sure as you are, we're in our homes. We're staying safe from the pandemic. Um, I'm still happy that I've had the opportunity to join you today. Um, and I want to start by thanking Virginia Robbins, the CEO and founder of the Diana Initiative. I wanna thank also her wonderful staff members and all of the volunteers that have helped me to get here today. It is not an easy thing to be the last 
talk of the day, um, basically to conclude and close out an event. But I thought that what I had to share was so important that you take the time to come along this journey with me. My name is Juliet Okafor. I am the CEO and founder of Revolution Cyber. I am the black female founder. A couple of years ago, I would not have been able to say that to you. I spent a lot of time hiding who I was in order to make people feel comfortable. And I'm so glad I can be here today to talk to you about the ways in which I've been able to successfully reclaim my space. I wanna start by talking to you about where this story all began. I am a, a, an attorney. I am the mother of two children. And my, my rise inside of cyber did not come the way many of you might expect. Some of you know my story. I was laid off from my job in 2013 at the same time I was pregnant with my daughter. And I was unable to get a job. And so I stayed out of work for about 10 months. And in doing so, I prayed, I fasted, and I begged for an opportunity to come up that would make it so that I would never, ever have to beg again. In 2014, I applied to a job online. It was a job for a sales executive for an MSSP in Ashburn. The company was True Shield. And I applied to it on Craigslist. I don't know how many of you guys use Craigslist now, but I would say don't, um, but I'm glad that I did. At that time, they had a, a position for an account executive. I would be leading the sales team. In fact, they had no sales team. I would actually be the first salesperson the CEO would hire. So what I did, I applied, they responded, and I drove over two hours to get to this interview. That's how desperate I was. But nothing at that time could stop me. I was determined to be successful, and I begged God that if I got one opportunity, if they cracked open the door, that I would kick it down, and so I did. I got an AC interview, I was offered the job, and I drove two hours each way for about a year. I finally ended up leaving True Shield to get another job at a better company, and by the time I had left, I, by the time I started, I was making $60,000, and by the time I got to my second role, I was making well into the 200s of thousands of dollars because I had proven myself and I'd done it expeditious, expeditiously. I'd done it unapologetically and I did it because I had no other choice. I'm also the daughter of chiefs. I'm Nigerian and my grandmother, my father, and my uncle are all chiefs. That made me actually a princess at a very young age. And as a Nigerian American, there was no question that I had to be successful. It was never something I even thought about. My options were to either be a lawyer, a doctor, a professor, or an engineer. My brother indicated he wanted to be a doctor. And I, watching Matlock at four, said I was going to be the lawyer. And so I basically created my entire life around this profession that I knew nothing about at four years old except I loved Matlock. And at the end, he always solved the case. So who wouldn't love that? As I started to progress in my career within cyber, it became clear to me that at times that were most instrumental in my life, the times that seemed the saddest, I was always able to rely on my very known history, my legacy, what I knew I had to do for my ancestors, or on just plain grit, pushing through, never failing, and always, always succeeding. 
And so many people don't even know that when I started my career in cybersecurity, it allowed me to get off of welfare. I was a mother of two children who was literally taking money from the state of Maryland because she could not support herself. So imagine a princess, a lawyer on welfare. That's my truth. That's who I was. But it wasn't going to be what defined me. And in fact, I'm not her anymore. I will never be her again. Those times are behind me. So part of my strategy in excelling and accelerating in this industry was that I created a really strong network from the beginning. As a salesperson in cybersecurity, you can imagine people did not want to talk to me. In fact, very literally, they would run away from me. And in doing so, kind of started to feel like a pariah. I felt some sort of way about it. But what I recognized is that they just needed to know me. They needed to get to know me better. And quite honestly, when they found out I was a salesperson who was an attorney, they really didn't want to get to know me. But we'll, we'll come back to that. That's a separate <laughs> conversation altogether. I spent every day, I was in the office until 10 o'clock at night, sitting in a sock, building new solutions for customers because if I were to sell something and I could be a resource, then I could be of help and they would come find me. That was my trick. I drew people to me. Why? Because everybody else was cold calling and I never loved to cold call. But I'd always known in my sales career that my relationships would be the things that I could lean on in order to raise business. So and in about 2015, um, I went to my boss and said, hey, I think it's time for a raise. That year, I blew it out of the park. I was brought on to start their commercial practice, flew to Zambia, helped their team to build out their first sock in the bank of Zanaco, worked with the CISO, even after to, to continue to deploy and make sure the solution was up and running. I was managing teams in the Philippines. This is in my first year. I was also, I had also replaced my boss. I went from account executive to director in four months. So I walk in, so of course I was entitled to my raise. I knew that. He didn't agree. And I remember it being late at night. It'd been a long day. I checked on the kids, walked into his office and said, you know, I've got a nanny. Now I've got expenses, I have to travel, I really need a raise. And, he had, and at that time, he had given me a raise to $80,000, but I was making a minimum of $3 million for him a year, minimum. And he said, he laughed. He said, no one is going to pay you that much if you leave here. You've been in the industry less than a year. Yes, you've been doing good work, but you will never make more than $80,000 in a year. I walked out of his office. I packed up my things and I drove home. That night, it was two, either 202 or 208. My phone lit up and it was LinkedIn. LinkedIn had a job announcement and it was for the VP of information security at Fortress. And so of course I said, nah, they're not going to pick me. He just, you know, he's already told me no one wants someone with, with the least experience I have, but I come from Kings. 
and chiefs. I applied because I wouldn't, he had told me that I wasn't worth more. I wasn't quite so sure. Now I did question whether or not I should be making this much, but it didn't stop me from doing the thing I thought I needed to do to get the position. Two months of interviews, flying back and forth, I was offered the job. My salary went up four times. That didn't even include commission because someone else had figured out what my boss couldn't, that I was worth more than I had been paid. And part of this conversation today is you are worth more than people tell you. And the people who tell you that you aren't valuable or worth what it is you think you're worth, you're in the wrong space. He didn't want to tear me down, but he also didn't want me to leave. And a lot of us women find ourselves in a position of wanting to do what we think is right, wanting to be loyal. And not that there's anything wrong with that, except when the loyalty to someone else conflicts with your loyalty to yourself, your best interests, your family, your goals, then there should be no loyalty at all. I became the first employee of a startup that didn't even exist when we started it. I was the male woman, I was the accountant, I was a graphic designer, I did marketing, I was the attorney, but I was so glad for the opportunity and to be in that space, it was scary as hell, I'll tell you. My family, my community thought I was nuts to fly myself to Orlando to meet with two guys who may or may not give me a job and risk a job that I knew I had, was stable, would never lose. But I had to do it. And I had to do it because I could not allow his belief about me to keep me down. I had to see if what was over this unknown was worth it. I was more afraid of what I would miss out on than what I would lose in staying where I was. I could have stayed, it would have been easier, but I didn't. And I haven't regretted it since. People always ask me, how did you get to where you are? How did you get into cyber? And I tell them, I didn't find cyber. Cyber found me. I humbly admit that I was desperate to get into cybersecurity. I, no, I was desperate to get a job. It just so happened to be a cyber sales job that I then leveraged to get a position in, um, in, as a VP, which then made me an expert because of all the things I had to learn, which allowed me to transition into a cyber professional role. You, you, you miss all the opportunities that you don't try for. Part of the, the, the obstacles that I've had to overcome to get where I am, those have been painful. Because the wins teach you lessons and the losses teach you lessons. The pleasure teaches you lessons and the pain teaches you lessons. I've learned a ton of lessons. And I'm learning them and I'm putting my body on the line every day so that other women don't have to learn the painful lessons I've learned. Several years ago, I, in about 2016, 2017, I had an experience that really almost 
shook me to the core. It was a lesson in the bro culture. It was a lesson in spaces that I could see, but would never set foot in. And it was about, I don't know that I feel like they tried to minimize me, but I know that they were very clear that I didn't belong. And so there was a meeting and we were in another meeting and everybody else had been invited to go to the next meeting. And of course I'm the only woman. The next meeting was going to be after hours and there were going to be drinks and there were going to be fun and stories and all sorts of things. I was not invited to go. And it was so clear and visceral that they were excluding me that I was shocked first and then I was mad. I was mad for a while because I questioned all the things that I was doing to put my body physically on the line for my job. Long nights, no sleep, on the road every day, every night, leaving my children, last minute deadlines. And in the end, it literally did not matter. I don't know if it's because I'm black or because I'm a woman or because I'm strong. That didn't matter. It was about the fact that someone wanted to make it clear to me that I did not belong. And so I took some time off. I took time to really think about what it was that I really wanted to do here. And I spent a lot of time questioning myself really feeling my energy. What is the matter? Why does this bother you? Why are you so upset? I don't even think I told you guys, and I'll walk back a little bit. There was an incident specifically that happened and and the being left out of the meeting came after that. I was at that time senior vice president I was on a conference call that I was leading. I had traveled to New York. And so I was in this like hotel and I had just gotten into the room, putting my bags down and I logged into the, to the call. And apparently there was something going on with my earphones. So I begin the meeting and there are myself and three gentlemen um, on my team. I begin the meeting and I'm talking and talking and then the the guys are like, Hey, Jules, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. So I'm like, Oh, let me fix it. We can't hear you. One of the guys says to me, you need to fix your effing phone. It's bothering me in my ear. It's hurting my ears. You need to fix it just like that. I was at the top of the proverbial food chain in that organization. And so I immediately thought, let me reach out and see, let me text my boss and see if he thinks that this behavior is okay. You know what the first response was? Well, what did you do? And I said, nothing. I, I didn't do anything to him. I'm not sure where this, you know, this anger is coming from. He said, There's no way he could have blown up on you and you didn't do anything. What did you do? And if the being cursed at wasn't enough, the being yelled at wasn't enough, then being accused of having done something to deserve it was the final straw for me. I just couldn't take it. Think about what I had just said. 
I had gone to a, on a trip. I had left again my children. I had been running into the hotel to get to my phone. And I was yelled at by somebody who was in a lesser role than me for bothering him because my earphone was too loud. And then my boss would do absolutely nothing to fix it. In fact, he wanted me to fix myself. And after that, I drafted an email, communicated it. And I was told to take some time off. I did, came back, and the brohood started. I was excluded, made to feel different, told I was a troublemaker. All these things happened. I, I, I was already, I think, on, my, on the end of burning out. I'd gone through a divorce that year. You know, I was on the road more frequently. Some of the really good guys I used to work with, they had left. We were on a really tough project that was failing and that I had to keep rescuing. And I just, I, I said, I, I got to step away. I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And part of what I didn't know then that I know now, at least what's been my experience, the things that pop up like this are not always about the person that I'm in the conflict with. The conflict is occurring because I've outgrown the space. The conflict is occurring because I stayed beyond the time I knew I probably should have left. It was occurring because there were indications and red flags that I was no longer wanted and I continued to persist. We have to know when it's time to pick up. We have to know when the space is no longer serving us. Because ladies, space matters. Space matters. And let me talk to you about why space matters. Whenever I think about space, think about open spaces, space is also what determines a place. Whatever spaces you occupy create places where you exist. Countless people will tell you that it's not important that someone is violating your space. But naturally, when someone violates your space, you feel uncomfortable. And that's a physical manifestation. But in the professional setting, you start to feel uncomfortable and on edge and anxious and stressed and having panic attacks when the space no longer serves you. And without a space, there is no place for you. And there's no place where you belong. See, because space matters, because it creates places, and we are all searching for places where we belong. It is natural and human to us. We just want to belong. So I took that as a sign that we had gone far enough, and I moved on. It was time to find another space. In 2019, I chose to open Revolution Cyber. Revolution Cyber is 
a game changer, personally and professionally, because I had been killing myself in someone else's business and then denying myself the joy of owning what I created. And my, that was my personal agony. And I didn't even know I was battling that, but I knew I was good. I didn't understand why other people couldn't appreciate how good I was. And so I felt like I always had to minimize myself. I felt like I was too much. And when I took the time off and started to think about where I could put my too much to use, I thought it was time to start my company. And I named it Revolution Cyber because it was time for a change. If you've recently seen my talk with Sarah Peters on Dark Reading, I talk quite a bit about diversity without change. Let me tell you, let me give you the example. So if you've been listening, I've talked to you about the fact that I was the only black woman in every room. I was there. So on the surface, there was no issue with race. I mean, I was their first employee. No issues there. But as we added more people and they did not look like me and they had different um, frameworks and different thoughts, different experiences, they had cultural things in common, I felt less and less like I belonged. Now, not just because I didn't look like everybody else, but because I was being excluded. And so diversity without inclusion is diversity without change. And diversity without change is a waste of everybody's time. And it creates harm to change agents like myself and other women. It puts us in the position to put our physical self in harm in order to make a change. And so what the game changer is for me in this company is that I am determined to create a platform for women who are seeking the opportunity to get in, up, and through cybersecurity. And I'm investing in friendships, lady friendships, creating my lady tribe. And I'm leaning on them the times I get burnt out, the times I get upset, the times I feel not heard. And I'm telling them, what's going on and getting advice from smart women like Ann Johnson. I am calling Gabby. I am texting Kirsten. I am on the phone with AMZ. These are women who motivate and inspire me. But I might not have actually created this without having started my company. So it's been my game changer. It changed everything. The downside to that, because every time you make a decision, you choose not to do something else, every decision has a cost. The downside to that is I spend a great deal of time trying to provide support and service and demonstrate to the industry that as a, one of the rare gems of a black female founder, that I can deliver high service, that we can deliver on time, that we deliver high quality, that we are the best that they'll ever meet. I spend a lot of time trying to figure out ways to do that. And then I also have to train the new young women, young men, minorities, LGBTQ, um, young men, young men who are from non-traditional careers, training them about the ways in which people perceive them so that they can have a fighting chance to win in cybersecurity. I have effectively created a space for people like me who just need a chance.
the point of this conversation today is that none of my obstacles have been easy to overcome. Not one of them was solved by another person. It all required that I know myself and that I choose myself over anyone else every single time. At my lowest point, I just wanted to quit this whole industry. I wanted to leave it for them, leave it for the guys. They can have this. I don't want it. I'll go back to being attorney. Think about my, my plan B is I'll go, I'm going to be an attorney. Like that's any better. Like, like there's no uh, diversity issues there. But I just, I, I just got so tired of proving that I can do it. And then every time I decide I want to give up, I am reminded, reminded of the people who came before me. What would have happened if John Lewis gave up or Harriet Tubman? My father was the first black salutatorian at Cornell University. He has such bad memories of America that when he was done with his education, he moved back and he has not lived here since. I don't have that option. I have two children who look up to me every single day. And it is for them that I rise. It is for the women who just want a leg in who no one can see that I rise. It's for the quiet, you know, mid-level woman who has all the traits to rock this industry, but can't bring herself to ask for the opportunity that I rise. I can't even tell you what it was I wanted to talk to you about today. It wasn't this. I have experienced so many different issues around gender, race, bias this week alone that it nearly, it it nearly took me back. But I rise. We all have to rise. When I talk about the need to rise, let me, let's talk about what rising means. W- women who rise, they don't ask, they take. Women who rise, they don't slouch, they sit up. Women who rise, Don't sit in the back of a conference room, the back of a bus, or the back of any room. They move to the front. Women who rise are seen and they are heard. Everywhere they are. Whether they're having a good day, a bad day, whether their hair is doing what it should, whether they don't feel so good, they rise every day because they are not the only ones who are impacted when they don't. When we walk away, when we give up, we are preventing the rise of so many women we can't see behind us and they need us to rise every day. They need us to give them hell every day. They need us to be unapologetic and undeterred by discomfort. They need us to sit on panels, boards, sit on, um, sit in, 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 in meetings. They need us to lead discussions. They need us to sit in, um, as a CEO of companies, security companies. They need us to be invested in by uh, um, venture capitalists. They need us to be executives. And if we choose to be individual contributors, they need us to be best in class. Because women 
we have always risen. I've lately been so disappointed in conversations that I'm having with male CISOs. They indicate to me an interest strongly in hiring more of us. When I first started this conversation a few years ago, I thought the issue was just that they did not want to give us a chance. And that's still very true. But the truth is also that we are afraid to stand. We turn down panels. We say no to research papers. We don't apply for positions. We don't respond to job requests. We don't submit for interviews. We don't follow up for interviews. We have come to a place where we expect that people will chase us to give us the job or the opportunity. But what is worth having is always worth the trouble. We've got to extend ourselves a little bit, ladies. We've got to be okay asking for the thing we know we want, but we don't think that we deserve. We've got to fight our imposter syndrome. We've got to, imposter syndrome has got to die. Let me tell you, ladies. My name is Juliet, and I have imposter syndrome. You wouldn't know that by the way I talk. But I called two of my really best, my best friends from college, and I had, you know, an epiphany. Can you believe? I think I've got imposter syndrome because I've wanted to start a podcast. I've been dying to, you know, do radio. I've been wanting to, you know, do this big marketing blitz, but I'm like, oh, I need to lose weight. Oh, I need to, you know, once I get these pounds off, once I move to Columbus, once I get this opportunity done, and on and on, and excuse after excuse, and none of it's been done. I sat down one morning, I couldn't sleep, and I said to myself, why are you struggling like this? Why won't you just do it? What do you need to hear to know that you're capable of it? You've seen the most mediocre men step up and start something and they're getting paid for what you could put together and kill. But there is that part of my brain that says, are you sure? What if it may not be good? See, I'm somebody who compartmentalizes, so I can both push through to get a client's work done and know that I'll knock it off the roof. But when it's something that, for me, I hedge. I question. I add all kinds of doubt to myself because in my mind, I question whether I deserve it. Do I deserve it? And I'm also afraid to commit. If I commit, then I'm in this thing and I can't get out of it. So one more thing. But the longer I take to make a decision about something, the less of a shot I have. Sure, things pop up and I could be, you know, someone could come to me and say, we want to pay you a gazillion dollars to be, you know, a podcast host. That's, that's rather unlikely. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like winning the lotto. And I stopped playing years ago. Don't judge me. If I am not willing to put myself on the line for myself, despite how uncomfortable I feel, I will be doing myself, this industry, my children, and the people behind me a really clear disservice. I have a voice, and so do you. Apply even if you're not sure you'll get it. Take the job. Say yes first. Sit on panels. Ask people for help. You can ask men well, you know, if they can help you. Men you trust. Do that. Don't sit idly by because we must rise. 
And when we rise, we increase representation for women in our field. We ensure opportunities for women who are still yet to come. And we make room in the industry for more of us, for those of us who are here to be seen and heard. So we must rise, you must stand up. It is not the time to sit back and be idle or to second guess. If we're going to be successful, this is the time. The time is now. This is the revolution. And it's untelevised. I know how you feel. I just admitted to you, I struggle with the same syndrome. But I'm fighting through it and so must you. You must fight every day like your life depended on it because it does the life you have today will dictate the life you have tomorrow therefore you must be planning today for what you want next and you must be using covid not as an excuse not to move but in it as a reason to prepare covid is giving us time with our families with ourselves away from the office with less distractions. This is your time. So anything in your inbox that's a request for something you've never done before, start by saying yes. Give your requirements, set your expectations, tell them your limitations and boundaries, but start by saying yes. Back in 2013, when I myself was on welfare, I begged for the opportunity like I have today. And every time I get, you know, down in my feelings, I remind myself, you wanted this. This was what you wanted. Now you're going to make an excuse? I don't have the ability to do that. I owe God so much it it doesn't even matter if you believe in god i owe myself so much my family my mother who was a who was also someone who raised us here alone for her sacrifice so i i i beat myself up sometimes because i'm like this is what you wanted what's the problem here's the problem juliet you're too big you're too dark, you're too loud, you're not loud enough, you work too hard, you show off. I don't really know you enough. I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what it is that people want. And most times I'm able to ignore it, but there are some days where it's just too much. I allow people to take up space in my head that don't belong there. Who are these they? Who are they? Why do they matter? If they pay your bills, maybe they matter. But if they just have opinions that have nothing to do with bettering your life, they don't matter. I've created a space. I hope to create spaces with some of you but we all have to continue to rise. And I'll admit that there are times when I get so down in the dumps about some of the things that I'm facing and I want to run away. I want to run, but I don't. One of the things that I do probably once a month is I will start to look for things that Maya Angelou has written. She was so able to write in, in a way that people immediately got and that shakes me from this I'm scared mess that I find myself in every day. So when I get down in the dumps, 
I simply go to one of her poems. And let me read you one of her poems. And many of you have probably heard it. It's called Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room, just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you wanna see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words and you may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of a slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. That is one of the most beautiful poems because it gives me goosebumps when I remember what our ancestors gave up for us to be here today what Susan B. Anthony did, how Harriet Tubman, you know, created the Underground Railroad, all the way to, you know, politicians like we know today, celebrities that have beat all odds, and the every working man and woman who wake up every day and rise despite all the turmoil, pain, and poverty. I rise because they rise. I rise because you rise. We have to rise. And I won't even fool you into thinking that what I'm asking you to do every day is easy. I won't do that. What I'll tell you is that it'll cost you lots of things. You may not be able to do the fun things that your friends can do. You may not be able to hang out with the people you used to. You may not be able to put your kids to bed sometimes, but sometimes you will rise and it will cost you. But if you determine that it's worth it, you will do it. And I ask you and implore you to do it. We all, like air, must rise. We must fill the space of the industry up and around. We must break ceilings to create space. We must break barriers to create space. We must respect and demand our boundaries be met to make our space safe. But we must rise, whether they like it or not. We must shed our likability complex. Because I'm a woman doesn't mean my goal is to be likable. You either like me or you don't, and I'm now okay with that. There are people who will be drawn to me and that I will be drawn to, and there will be others that I need to shed. I am okay shedding those who no longer serve me. I no longer put my likability first. Either love me or leave me alone. Long term, 
we've been conditioned over time to be well liked when what we should really be is respected. We've been taught that we have to be nice when really we should be paid. We no longer have to sacrifice ourselves, ladies, in order to get the things that we want. We can have both our dreams met and the man of our dreams or the house down the road or the woman who we love. We have the right to choose, but I'm asking you to choose to rise despite all else because in rising, we take up space and space Taking up space is change, it's action, it's movement, it's motion. It's disruptive. Change makes things different. It disrupts the status quo. Every time you rise, you take up more space. People just have to move over to make room for you. And we're not going to ask. No, we're not going to ask. We're going to demand. Learn to sit in your discomfort. Rising. When I rise, someone must fall. And I'll admit, I'd never want it to be my sisters, my friends, my family, my community. But I'm going to be honest about first not making it my responsibility to make sure people don't fall over, fall out, fall in, fall off. That's not my responsibility as a woman. I am a nurturer to children. I'm a nurturer to my partner. I do not have to nurture the feelings of sensitive men. That's just not what I'm here for. You have to sit in the discomfort because it will come from all directions every day and the goal is to push you aside the goal is to reclaim space if you start to see it as your space or their space you'll start to understand what i'm saying you must rise you must be proud and strong you must not give up and every day you have to start again take another risk apply for a new job lead the project you have to keep rising and pushing and making your space in this industry because i find that we have these great fits and starts forward and then all of a sudden because we're in a microcosm of the of the society we live in we get pushed back and that is the natural order of things like when someone is trying to make a change, make a major change, lose weight, um, they're, they're looking to stop you know, bad habits, it is easier to continue to do what you're doing, to keep things the way they are. And so naturally, the industry we're in is predisposed to being the way it is. In order for it to change, we've actually got to force it. We can't sit down and allow things to happen around us. We've got to be the change makers. This is our time in cyber. This is the time for women and minorities in cyber and LGBTQ and um, even veterans and those who are um, disabled, those who are new, who, who, um, who have neurodiverse um, frameworks, and, I, and I'm one of those. This is our time. But I'll tell you, we have to do it with the full community, and men are people too. In fact, all of my opportunities in cyber have come from men. So I, I implore you not to take this as a male bashing session. It's about loving yourself enough to ask for what you want and not to allow anyone to step into your space. And ladies, I mean this. Physically violating you, inappropriate touching, inappropriate comments, making you feel uncomfortable in your own skin, or 
making you feel like you can't look good because someone else can't take it. When we rise, we look good doing it and they'll just have to accept it. And if you find that they cannot accept it, if you find that the people who you're talking to are unable to handle you and your badass, if they cannot stand your beauty or you make them feel like less than a man or you're working with a woman who's challenging you or being someone who is not your supporter, I'm going to tell you one phrase that I've heard recently that I think plays in any situation that I just mentioned. Men have a wonderful way of not letting things bother them. It rolls off of them so easily. And one of the phrases that I heard recently, when I get frustrated or someone says something that they want me to be upset about but I'm not, I'm going to teach it to you today. When some man makes you feel like you don't deserve it or some opportunity comes up and there's competition and you're afraid that you might hurt somebody else, I want you to sit up, look around, and then look directly at the person and let them know it is what it is. Never lose your space because spaces create places and places are where you belong and you belong here. We belong here. And so keep rising. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so glad you could come with me into my household and please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. It, I've had a wonderful time today. I am just trying to recover myself, actually. <laughs> oh that my was God, what was Definitely it? worth oh. the wait. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is just blown. I, I, I got the wrong link like three times in the chat because I could not, I, I just, could not deal with anything else. <laughs> thank you. So amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I, I can't even thank you. <laughs> that all came out of me today. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I am so glad that <laughs> we were able to upload this, even if it took a, a, an extra while. I mean, we, we made it through. Thank you guys so much for your patience. So good. I'm gonna try to. Uh, I hope you all connect with Jules in chat and continue the conversation. And obviously, I think there was a specific. You put your Twitter handle in there, so those of you asking about the Lady Squad, yes, a lot of follow up for everyone to do on that one. <laughs> I just posted again the correct link for Jules' survey. So if you didn't uh, get her feedback yet, please do. This, oh, I, I wish everyone everywhere could, could watch this and just get like amazing feedback. Uh, I'm sorry, Jules, you're gonna have to be <laughs> content with us here. <laughs> oh my God, this was amazing though. It brought out a lot of things in me I didn't even know was in there. So I'm like, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. And for everyone that wants to join uh, the socials, just remember they're in the networking uh, area of the Hopping, their network fe feature in Hopping. You can get connected with people from everywhere just that are participating in the DNA initiative. And I hope you all have fun. We're definitely going to need some alcohol to process this. <laughs> cause... Oh, boy. Well, Thanks, everyone. Intense. <laughs>